Chapter Nineteen of Leviathan. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anna Simon. Leviathan by Thomas Hobbes. Chapter Nineteen. Of the several kinds of commonwealth by institution, and of succession to the sovereign power. The difference of commonwealths consisteth in the difference of the sovereign or the person representative of all and every one of the multitude. And because the sovereignty is either in one man, or in an assembly of more than one, and into that assembly either every man hath right to enter, or not every one but certain men distinguished from the rest, it is manifest there can be but three kinds of commonwealth. For the representative must needs be one man, or more. And if more, then it is the assembly of all, or but of a part. When the representative is one man, then is the commonwealth a monarchy. When an assembly of all that will come together, then it is a democracy, or popular commonwealth. When an assembly of a part only, then it is called an aristocracy. Other kind of commonwealth there can be none, for either one, or more, or all, must have the sovereign power, which I have shown to be indivisible, entire. There be other names of government in the histories and books of policy, as tyranny and oligarchy, but they are not the names of other forms of government, but of the same forms misliked. For they that are discontented under monarchy call it tyranny, and they that are displeased with aristocracy call it oligarchy. So also they which find themselves grieved under a democracy call it anarchy, which signifies want of government and yet I think no man believes that want of government is any new kind of government. Nor by the same reason ought they to believe that the government is of one kind when they like it, and another when they mislike it, or are oppressed by the governors. It is manifest that men who are in absolute liberty may, if they please, give authority to one man to represent them every one, as well as give such authority to any assembly of men whatsoever and consequently may subject themselves, if they think good, to a monarch as absolutely as to other representative. Therefore, where there is already erected a sovereign power, there can be no other representative of the same people, but only to certain particular ends, by the sovereign limited. For that were to erect two sovereigns, and every man to have his person represented by two actors that, by opposing one another, must needs divide that power, which, if men will live in peace, is indivisible, and thereby reduce the multitude into the condition of war, contrary to the end for which all sovereignty is instituted. And therefore, as it is absurd to think that a sovereign assembly, inviting the people of their dominion to send up their deputies with power to make known their advice or desires, should therefore hold such deputies, rather than themselves, for the absolute representative of the people. So it is absurd also to think the same in a monarchy. And I know not how this, so manifest a truth, should of late be so little observed, that in a monarchy he that had the sovereignty from a descent of six hundred years was alone called sovereign, had the title of majesty from every one of his subjects, and was unquestionably taken by them for their king was notwithstanding never considered as their representative. That name without contradiction passing for the title of those men which at his command were sent up by the people to carry their petitions, and give him, if he permitted it, their advice, which may serve as an admonition for those that are the true and absolute representative of a people, to instruct men in the nature of that office, and to take heed how they admit of any other general representation upon any occasion whatsoever if they mean to discharge the trust committed to them. The difference between these three kinds of commonwealth consisteth not in the difference of power, but in the difference of convenience or aptitude to produce the peace and security of the people, for which end they were instituted. And to compare monarchy with the other two we may observe, first, that whosoever beareth the person of the people, or is one of that assembly that bears it, beareth also his own natural person. And though he be careful in his politic person to procure the common interest, 
yet he is more, or no less, careful to procure the private good of himself, his family, kindred, and friends. And for the most part, if the public interest chance to cross the private, he prefers the private, for the passions of men are commonly more potent than their reason. From whence it follows that where the public and private interest are most closely united, there is the public most advanced. Now, in monarchy, the private interest is the same with the public. The riches, power, and honor of a monarch arise only from the riches, strength, and reputation of his subjects. For no king can be rich, nor glorious, nor secure, whose subjects are either poor, or contemptible, or too weak through want, or dissension, to maintain a war against their enemies. Whereas, in a democracy, or aristocracy, the public prosperity confers not so much to the private fortune of one that is corrupt or ambitious, as doth many times a perfidious advice, a treacherous action, or a civil war. Secondly, that a monarch receiveth counsel of whom, when, and where he pleaseth, and consequently may hear the opinion of men versed in the matter about which he deliberates, of what rank or quality soever, and as long before the time of action and with as much secrecy as he will. But when a sovereign assembly has need of counsel, none are admitted but such as have a right thereto from the beginning, which for the most part are of those who have been versed more in the acquisition of wealth than of knowledge, and are to give their advice in long discourses which may, and do commonly, excite men to action, but not govern them in it. For the understanding is by the flame of the passions never enlightened, but dazzled, nor is there any place or time wherein an assembly can receive counsel secretly, because of their own multitude. Thirdly, that the resolutions of a monarch are subject to no other inconstancy than that of human nature, but in assemblies, besides that of nature, there ariseth an inconstancy from the number, for the absence of a few that would have the resolution once taken continue firm, which may happen by security, negligence, or private impediments, or the diligent appearance of a few of the contrary opinion, undoes to-day all that was concluded yesterday. Fourthly, that a monarch cannot disagree with himself out of envy or interest, but an assembly may, and that to such a height as may produce a civil war. Fifthly, that in monarchy there is this inconvenience, that any subject, by the power of one man, for the enriching of a favourite or flatterer, may be deprived of all he possesseth, which I confess is a great and inevitable inconvenience. But the same may as well happen where the sovereign power is in an assembly, for their power is the same, and they are as subject to evil counsel, and to be seduced by orators, as a monarch by flatterers. And becoming one another's flatterers, serve one another's covetousness and ambition by turns. And whereas the favourites of monarchs are few, and they have none else to advance but their own kindred, the favourites of an assembly are many, and the kindred much more numerous than of any monarch. Besides, there is no favourite of a monarch which cannot as well succour his friends as hurt his enemies. But orators, that is to say, favourites of sovereign assemblies, though they have great powers to hurt, have little to save. For to accuse requires less eloquence, such is man's nature, than to excuse. And condemnation, than absolution, more resembles justice. Sixthly, that it is an inconvenience in monarchy that the sovereignty may descend upon an infant, or one that cannot discern between good and evil, and consisteth in this that the use of his power must be in the hand of another man, or of some assembly of men, which are to govern by his right, and in his name, as curators and protectors of his person and authority. But to say there is inconvenience in putting the use of the sovereign power into the hand of a man, or an assembly of men, is to say that all government is more inconvenient than confusion and civil war and therefore all the danger that can be pretended must arise from the contention of those that for an office of so great honour and profit may become competitors to make it appear that this inconvenience proceeded not from that form of government we call monarchy 
we are to consider that the president monarch hath appointed who shall have the tuition of his infant successor, either expressly by testament, or tacitly by not controlling the custom in that case received. And then such inconvenience, if it happen, is to be attributed not to the monarchy, but to the ambition and injustice of the subjects, which in all kinds of government, where the people are not well instructed in their duty and the rights of sovereignty, is the same. Or else the precedent monarch hath not at all taken order for such tuition, and then the law of nature hath provided this sufficient rule, that the tuition shall be in him that hath by nature most interest in the preservation of the authority of the infant, and to whom least benefit can accrue by his death or diminution. For seeing every man by nature seeketh his own benefit and promotion, to put an infant into the power of those that can promote themselves by his destruction or damage is not tuition, but treachery. So that sufficient provision being taken against all just quarrel about the government under a child, if any contention arise to the disturbance of the public peace, it is not to be attributed to the form of monarchy, but to the ambition of subjects and ignorance of their duty. On the other side, there is no great commonwealth, the sovereignty whereof is in a great assembly, which is not, as to consultations of peace and war and making of laws, in the same condition as if the government were in a child. For as a child wants the judgment to dissent from counsel given him, and is thereby necessitated to take the advice of them or him to whom he is committed, so an assembly wanted the liberty to dissent from the counsel of the major part, be it good or bad. And, as a child has need of a tutor or protector to preserve his person and authority, so also in great commonwealths the sovereign assembly, in all great dangers and troubles, have need of custodis libertatis, that is, of dictators or protectors of their authority, which are as much as temporary monarchs to whom for a time they may commit the entire exercise of their power, and have, at the end of that time, been oftener deprived thereof than infant kings by their protectors, regents, or any other tutors. Though the kinds of sovereignty be, as I have now shown, but three, that is to say, monarchy, where one man has it, or democracy, where the general assembly of subjects has it, or aristocracy, where it is in an assembly of certain persons nominated or otherwise distinguished from the rest. Yet he that shall consider the particular commonwealths that have been and are in the world will not perhaps easily reduce them to three, and may thereby be inclined to think there be other forms arising from these mingled together. As, for example, elective kingdoms, where kings have the sovereign power put into their hands for a time. Or kingdoms wherein the king hath a power limited, which governments are nevertheless by most writers called monarchy. Likewise, if a popular or aristocratical commonwealth subdue an enemy's country, and govern the same by a president, procurator, or other magistrate, this may seem perhaps at first sight to be a democratical or aristocratical government, but it is not so. For elective kings are not sovereigns, but ministers of the sovereign, nor limited kings sovereigns, but ministers of them that have the sovereign power. Nor are those provinces which are in subjection to a democracy or aristocracy of another commonwealth, democratically or aristocratically governed, but monarchically. And first, concerning an elective king whose power is limited to his life, as it is in many places of Christendom at this day, or to certain years or months, as the dictator's power amongst the Romans, if he have right to appoint his successor, he is no more elective, but hereditary. But if he have no power to elect his successor, then there is some other man, or assembly, known, which after his decease may elect a new, or else the commonwealth dieth, or dissolveth with him, and returneth to the condition of war. If it be known who hath the power to give the sovereignty after his death, it is known also that the sovereignty was in them before for none have right to give that which they have not right to possess, and keep to themselves if they think good. But if there be none that can give the sovereignty after the decease of him that was first elected, then has he power, nay, he is obliged by the law of nature, to provide, by establishing a successor, 
to keep to those that had trusted him with the government from relapsing into the miserable condition of civil war and consequently he was when elected a sovereign absolute secondly that king whose power is limited is not superior to him or them that have the power to limit it and he that is not superior is not supreme that is to say not sovereign the sovereignty therefore was always in that assembly which had the right to limit him and by consequence the government not monarchy but either democracy or aristocracy as of all times in sparta where the kings had a privilege to lead their armies but the sovereignty was in the ephori thirdly whereas heretofore the roman people governed the land of judea for example by a president yet was not judea therefore a democracy because they were not governed by any assembly into which any of them had right to enter nor by an aristocracy because they were not governed by any assembly into which any man could enter by their election but they were governed by one person which though as to the people of rome was an assembly of the people or democracy yet as to the people of judea which had no right at all of participating in the government was a monarch for though where the people are governed by an assembly chosen by themselves out of their own number the government is called a democracy or aristocracy yet when they are governed by an assembly not of their own choosing it is a monarchy not of one man over another man but of one people over another people of all these forms of government the matter being mortal so that not only monarchs but also whole assemblies die it is necessary for the conservation of the peace of men that as there was order taken for an artificial man so there be order also taken for an artificial eternity of life without which men that are governed by an assembly should return into the condition of war in every age and they that are governed by one man as soon as their governor dieth this artificial eternity is that which men call the right of succession there is no perfect form of government where the disposing of the succession is not in the present sovereign for if it be in any other particular man or private assembly it is in a person subject and may be assumed by the sovereign at his pleasure and consequently the right is in himself and if it be in no particular man but left to a new choice then is the commonwealth dissolved and the right is in him that can get it contrary to the intention of them that did institute the commonwealth for their perpetual and not temporary security in a democracy the whole assembly cannot fail unless the multitude that are to be governed fail and therefore questions of the right of succession have in that form of government no place at all in an aristocracy when any of the assembly dieth the election of another into his room belonged to the assembly as the sovereign to whom belongeth the choosing of all councillors and officers for that which the representative doth as actor every one of the subjects doth as author and though the sovereign assembly may give power to others to elect new men for supply of their court yet it is still by their authority that the election is made and by the same it may when the public shall require it be recalled the greatest difficulty about the right of succession is in monarchy and the difficulty ariseth from this that at first sight it is not manifest who is to appoint the successor nor many times who it is whom he hath appointed for in both these cases there is required a more exact ratio to the nation than every man is accustomed to use as to the question who shall appoint the successor of a monarch that hath the sovereign authority that is to say who shall determine of the right of inheritance for elective kings and princes have not the sovereign power in propriety but in use only we are to consider that either he that is in possession has right to dispose of the succession or else that right is again in the dissolved multitude for the death of him that hath the sovereign power and property leaves the multitude without any sovereign at all that is without any representative in whom they should be united and be capable of doing any one action at all and therefore they are incapable of election of any new monarch every man having equal right to submit himself to such as he thinks best able to protect him or if he can protect himself by his own sword which is a return to confusion and to the condition of a war of every man against every man contrary to the end for which monarchy had its first institution 
Therefore it is manifest that by the institution of monarchy the disposing of the successor is always left to the judgment and will of the present possessor. And for the question which may arise sometimes, who it is that the monarch in possession hath designed to the succession and inheritance of his power, it is determined by his express words and testament, or by other tacit signs sufficient. By express words or testament, when it is declared by him in his lifetime, viva voce, or by writing, as the first emperors of Rome declared who should be their heirs. For the word heir does not of itself imply the children or nearest kindred of a man, but whomsoever a man shall any way declare he would have to succeed him in his estate. If, therefore, a monarch declare expressly that such a man shall be his heir, either by word or writing, then is that man, immediately after the decease of his predecessor, invested in the right of being monarch. But where testament and express words are wanting, other natural signs of the will are to be followed, whereof the one is custom. And therefore, where the custom is that the next of kindred absolutely succeeded, there also the next of kindred hath right to the succession. For that, if the will of him that was in possession had been otherwise, he might easily have declared the same in his lifetime. And likewise, where the custom is that the next of the male kindred succeedeth, there also the right of succession is in the next of the kindred male, for the same reason. And so it is, if the custom were to advance the female. For whatsoever custom a man may by a word control, and does not, it is a natural sign he would have that custom stand. But where neither custom nor testament hath proceeded, there it is to be understood, first, that a monarch's will is that the government remain monarchical, because he hath approved that government in himself. Secondly, that a child of his own, male or female, be preferred before any other, because men are presumed to be more inclined by nature to advance their own children than the children of other men, and of their own rather a male than a female, because men are naturally fitter than women for actions of labour and danger. Thirdly, where his own issue faileth, rather a brother than a stranger, and so still the nearer in blood rather than the more remote, because it is always presumed that the nearer of kin is the nearer in affection. And it is evident that a man receives always by reflection the most honour from the greatness of his nearest kindred. But if it be lawful for a monarch to dispose of the succession by words of contract or testament, Man may perhaps object a great inconvenience, for he may sell or give his right of governing to a stranger, which, because strangers, that is, men not used to live under the same government, nor speaking the same language, do commonly undervalue one another, may turn to the oppression of his subjects, which is indeed a great inconvenience. But it proceeded not necessarily from the subjection to a stranger's government, but from the unskilfulness of the governors ignorant of the true rules of politics. And therefore the Romans, when they had subdued many nations to make their government digestible, were wont to take away that grievance as much as they thought necessary, by giving sometimes to whole nations, and sometimes to principal men of every nation they conquered, not only the privileges, but also the name of Romans, and took many of them into the Senate, and offices of charge, even in the Roman city. And this was it our most wise king, King James, aimed at in endeavouring the union of his two realms of England and Scotland, which, if he could have obtained, had in all likelihood prevented the civil wars which make both those kingdoms at this present miserable. It is not, therefore, any injury to the people, for a monarch to dispose of the succession by will, though by the fault of many princes, it hath been sometimes found inconvenient. Of the lawfulness of it, this also is an argument, that whatsoever inconvenience can arrive by giving a kingdom to a stranger, may arrive also by so marrying with strangers, as the right of succession may descend upon them. Yet this by all men is accounted lawful. End of chapter 19